series of uh, quite a few authors um, have come together to think about how the St. Francis encounter with the leper has um, what sort of wisdom we can take as we think about the pandemic. Um, okay, so I'll introduce our speakers. I'm going to go in the order that um, we'll be presenting tonight. Um, so as far as our, our main presentations, I'll be going first, and I am the Associate Professor of Religion and Society here at the Franciscan School of Theology um, and a research fellow at um, the USC's uh, Center for Religion and Civic Culture. Um, and, and I am an award-winning author, and my books and articles can be found in both Catholic and academic publications, including Cact Catholic Activism Today and Young Adult American Catholics. Um, I'm a sociologist. I have training in theology as well, and so my teaching and research areas include American civic-like, Catholicism, family, and social ethics. Um, and currently, I'm serving the Franciscans in a unique way. I'm serving the order by helping them with an international um, on an international commission exploring affective maturity and how that can connect to formation. Um, and our second speaker tonight is Sister Suzanne Meyer. As Professor Emerita, Sister Suzanne Mayer has served in Newman University in various positions over 25 years. Um, as part-time and full-time professor and eventually the director of, pa of the pastoral counseling program, she continues to support students, especially in their work in the final seminar. A former English teacher, Sister continues to engage in what she loves, not only in her work in classes, but as an editor and reader for various counseling journals. Her main dedication is to integrating spirituality and psychology and helping clients heal. Writing the chapter on Sister Marianne Cope of Molokai helped her to do both. And our final um, speaker is um, Jeff Carabin. Um, and he is not only the final speaker on the panel, but he's also the editor of the entire collection that we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, so Jeff Carabin is an associate professor of philosophy at Newman University. He first came to Newman in 2008 as an adjunct instructor and was hired full-time after completing his doctorate at Villanova University. His primary academic interests include the study of life after death with a special, with a specific focus on the beliefs and, sorry, amenability or lack of amenability to violence. He is also interested in existential philosophy and the thought of Gabriel Marcel in particular, the emerging school of thought known as transhumanism and with his recent book, Francis. He is blessed with his with a wife, Kristen, and three children, Blake 14, Caroline 12, and Abigail 7. His personal interests uh, include distance running, skiing, hiking, camping, traveling, and rooting for Philadelphia sports teams. He is active in the community as a Boy Scout leader and, when needed, as a coach. And so that, that's our speakers for tonight. And so, Jeff, I'm going to hand it over to you to tell us a little bit about the book before we get into the formal presentations. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you, Maureen. And uh, let me share my screen and go from there. All right. Well, first and foremost, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak here, to share uh, this book and to, to speak with this audience. Um, it's a great honor. Uh, you know, and I'm incredibly privileged and joyous for the opportunity. Uh, for FST and for you in particular, Maureen, for putting this panel together. Um, and, you know, it's a little later here on the East Coast, uh, but it actually uh, is part of my bio, uh, the Boy Scout stuff, uh, just coming from some Boy Scout meetings. So uh, the late night actually worked out pretty well in that regard. So uh, without further ado, let me get into it uh, and uh, talk about this collection. Uh, and to begin, I was asked to kind of give an origin story about uh, the work. And for me, uh, it started in the classroom and uh, at a Catholic Franciscan university. Uh, unsurprisingly, we teach Catholic Franciscan thoughts. And probably like many others uh, teaching Francis, I would look at some of his pivotal moments in his life, some of the key stories, uh, think about what that means to us today. And when COVID hit, uh, Francis and the lepers, that story took on a, a kind of a new resonance. Um, you know, here we have this individual who's one of his iconic acts, you know, a turning point in his life uh, was spending time with uh, these people with a deadly and infectious disease. And here we have COVID, you know, we're dealing with a deadly infectious disease. So what does Francis have to tell us, you know, and how do we think about Francis? So that kind of conversation 
uh, led to the more specific question uh, that animated um, the beginning of this project. Uh, and that was, should we look at Francis uh, as a religious fanatic or and or should we look at COVID and our response to COVID as in some way fanatical? And how do those two uh, inform each other? All right. So that led to a conference style paper. Uh, and my original kind of plan was just develop that into a journal article and submit it and kind of be on my way. Uh, but as I engaged in the project, uh, I realized it was deserving of much more than any kind of single perspective or single author I uh, could do it justice. And that's because of, one, the complexity of the, the pandemic. You know, here was this global uh, phenomenon that impacted our lives in so many different ways. And you have the profundity of Francis. And so for me, that called for something more. And uh, I began writing the book proposal, uh, began reaching out to authors. And uh, the result was uh, Ethics uh, Press picked it up. And uh, ironically or not, 19 contributors uh, for the COVID-19 book uh, ended up uh, being our final tally. Uh, and so those are the names of the contributors. And uh, I'll be speaking about them uh, later on. Uh, some personal takeaways. So for me, uh, by far the greatest blessing of my professional career. Uh, it's been an incredible journey to, to learn from these authors, uh, to get a deeper understanding of Francis. And, uh, you know, I'm forever grateful. Um, in terms of the uh, FST in particular, you know, I want to thank Maureen and Darlene Prides and Brother William Short, uh, each of which contributed a chapter to the collection. And uh, they're all excellent uh, chapters. Um, you know, personally, I didn't come into this uh, as a Franciscan. Uh, I've been in Catholic school my entire life from, you know, kindergarten to college to, to graduate school uh, and now in teaching. Uh, but in my undergrad, I was trained uh, at Loyola down in uh, Baltimore. So I had kind of the Jesuit tradition there. And then I went overseas uh, and then I went back to Villanova for my doctorate. So I got that Augustinian tradition and uh, I really kind of got into Francis or became I came to know Francis uh, through my time here at Newman. And what I can say is that uh, I'm really kind of inspired by Francis. I'm inspired by the fact that, you know, despite perhaps appearances, he is uh, really profound and he asks challenging questions. Uh, and as a philosopher, you know, I like the fact that he doesn't give kind of simple answers to uh, some of our complex problems. Uh, all right. So with that, uh, I want to just kind of place the embrace and kind of place the collection a little bit. Uh, you may or may not have noticed that I'm using Francis and the lepers in the plural. So Francis embrace the lepers. Uh, and I thought that was appropriate because uh, Whatever the icon, right, we have the iconic image of Francis getting off the horse, you know, embracing that single leper on the road to Assisi. And whether or not that's historically true, you know, I know there's debates about that. Um, the reality was his conversion involved a lifelong uh, ministry to the lepers and multiple lepers. And so I think the plural kind of captures that. Um, as a text, you know, I think one of the things that this text does uh, is it kind of just reiterates the profound way in which Francis and Franciscanism uh, are meant for pandemic times. Um, you know, obviously Francis and leprosy, uh, but you see throughout the history, there is this attention to those that suffer from disease and death. And in the research, you know, I noticed that there were quite a few references to the AIDS pandemic and how Francis and the embrace of the lepers really inspired, um, you know, Franciscans during that time. You know, again, with a deadly infectious disease, a terrifying disease, a disease that, like leprosy, was often associated with uh, moral deviancy. Uh, and you had that compassion coming from uh, this model of Francis. And in the in the text itself, uh, Heidi Geibel and, and Barbara Spees uh, and Christina Welch all bring uh, COVID and the AIDS pandemic together as well. Uh, and then finally, you know, in terms of what this collection maybe adds to Franciscan scholarship. Uh, and I can certainly be corrected if I'm wrong here, uh, but I think it's the only uh, full book-like text devoted to uh, this embrace. And uh, given how essential it was for Francis, you know, as he describes it as a turning point in his life, uh, I thought that was um, useful or, or valuable. Uh, all right, so that's uh, kind of my introduction of the project. And uh, I'm going to hand it off now to uh, Maureen, who's going to talk about her chapter. Uh, 
All right, thank you. And um, thanks for that context for helping us understand what we're about to go into next. Um, let me share my screen. There we go. And just a second while that fades. Okay. We can all see fine if I can, Jeff or Brady. Okay, great. So the title of my chapter is, hold on, I can't see very well. I need to minimize. There we go. The title of my chapter is Justice and Mercy Over Exclusion and Isolation, the Pandemic and Africa. And instead of giving you a quick little abstract, I'm just going to dive right into, I've constructed um, a brief, like an, a, 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 an excerpt sort of of my chapter, the, the major points. So I'll just go straight into that. A global 21st century pandemic that costs countless lives, stalls economies, and isolates households. A medieval son of a merchant who offers mercy to a leper near Assisi. Although these two stories share some obvious similarities, like disease, and they also share some differences, like social historical context, there is untapped wisdom in Francis's story that should inform our reflection and response, not only to this pandemic, but, to our but also our relationship with one another on the interpersonal and global scale. So my presentation tonight will demonstrate that social exclusion and isolation, characterizing those living with leprosy in Francis's context, are still with us, tragically shaping the pandemic spread and our social response. It will also show that Francis's encounter with a leper illum or what it illuminates um, as an alternative as far as ex exclusion and isolation of our current global reality. Francis's encounter elevates justice and mercy and their profound transformative power. So um, just to give you an outline of what's to come, um, I'm gonna begin by providing some background literature on the sociology of disaster to show the ways in which human social life can have a profound impact on events that we might mistakenly identify as purely natural. And next, I'm gonna outline how human choices outline the pandemics, or in, sorry, impact the pandemic spread and vaccination protocols with a particular interest in Africa. And finally, I will invite us to rethink our personal and global relationships in light of Francis's encounter with the leper with a focus on justice and mercy. Okay, so beginning, um, background literature, sociology of disaster. So rarely is there such a thing as a purely natural disaster. In virtually every natural disaster, there's some sort of social element at play. Uh, the social impact could be connected to the cause of the disaster. Um, it could be connected to the immediate response of the disaster. And it could also be uh, connected to the long-term response and once the most severe elements of the disaster have subsided or any combination of these. We can see the human impact on the pandemic at each of these levels. So understanding these with a bit more depth is critical um, uh, before we can move on. So before proceeding, uh, given the theological focus of what's going on here uh, tonight, um, it's critical that we briefly consider, quote, social disaster through a theological lens. Um, to identify an element of a disaster as a social disaster, owing to willful ignorance, a lack of reasonable knowledge, negligence, individualism, a lack of fidelity, some, a sense of superiority, or some other vicious attitude, is to say in theological terms that a social sin has been committed. So let's not lose sight as, of the theological truth, even though we're talking about um, some sociological pieces and what follows here. Okay. So an example of human social life causing a disaster is most clearly demonstrated in the climate crisis. Human choices shaped by consumption of natural resources, industrial production and pollutants, non-regulation of air, water and land management have been major causes of the warming of our planet. At other times, a disaster's initial cause is much more quote natural, but the consequences are more devastating due to established social patterns or human choices. So Hurricane Katrina flooded New Orleans, but the impact was most grave in lower income neighborhoods and neighborhoods in which resided a higher proportion of black residents. Uh, similarly, uh, the Sichuan earthquake of 2008 was so destructive, not simply because of its magnitude, 
but because so many of the public schools were built by contractors who promised low prices by compromising safety standards. Further, because many of the children who died in the earthquake were born during child, China's one-child policy, many parents lost their only child. With COVID-19, uh, later we will explore what, the, what its initial spread tells us about contemporary power, especially social exclusion and isolation. The Chicago heat wave of 1995 highlights the failure of an adequate initial response. Lasting only five days, the heat wave is estimated to have claimed over 700 lives. And many resources were available, such as air conditioned, sorry, such as air conditioned cooling centers. And, and many people took advantage of these, but there were those who were older and afraid to leave their homes. There were also a handful of people from all ages who were rendered more vulnerable because they had fewer social ties. In fact, any sort of social tie, even simply owning a pet, increased one's likelihood of surviving the heat wave. It was the disconnected and forgotten who's, who succumbed, as this funeral for 41 unclaimed bodies illustrates. Looking at longer term human responses, uh, when government housing offices sought to rehome people displaced by the Buffalo Creek disaster, in which a series of dams broke, releasing 130 million gallons of water, killing 125 people and shattering a community, they sought to rehome families as quickly as possible and did not try to place neighbors next to one another. Because they because they recovered housing, but never recovered the relationships and community that animated their lives, the psychological trauma of the flood remained strong even one year after the event. Uh, the plan for COVID-19 vaccine distribution demonstrates the short and long-term social response to a disease, again revealing who has been socially excluded. All right, so my second part is thinking about Go, is taking kind of this social responsibility piece um, to understanding a disaster to the understanding the social disaster of COVID-19 with a special focus on Africa. So the New York Times created a very simple but thorough timeline of the pandemic. The first entry, December 31st, 2019, references a mysterious virus identified in Wuhan. The time frame continues as the disease spreads throughout East Asia and beyond, including Europe, the Middle East, Latin America, United States, and India, and Russia, leaving a wake of death and economic destruction in its path. Five months after that New Year's Eve entry, um, on June 4th, that is the first mention of Africa or any African country. It really wasn't a neglect in media coverage, but the reality was that for several months, while many other regions of the world had been ravaged by the pandemic, Africa remained relatively untouched. Uh, while it would at first um, appearances seem that it would be very fortunate to have a very fortunate thing to have evaded the virus for so long, this actually signals something inexcusable, the exclusion and isolation of Africa from the global community. The spread of the disease in Africa remembers much, resembles much of the rest of the world, save the lag. So once the virus hit those African countries in a more significant way, it spread with the same rapidity as those infected at the outset. Uh, the continent recorded its first confirmed case in mid-February mid 2000, and it took 100 days to rise to 100,000 cases, but fewer than 20 days to leap to 200,000 cases. Um, spread has much to do with the connection and social networks and will access and move through a community the more numerous those social ties are. And although a long discussion of the ways wealthy countries create policies that secure their economic advantage over others and even exploit the disparity is beyond the scope of my presentation tonight, uh, this international crafting as policy is, is one form of social exclusion that has affected the economic possibilities of many. African countries um, in many African countries. Uh, isolation is another phenomenon that can happen at the, at the personal or social level. Less deliberate than exclusion, but rendering one similarly invisible, one source of isolation is a dismissive attitude, commonly or consciously or otherwise, of a person or party. In other words, the person, group, or 
nation is not seen as significant to your own existence. And so this person or party rarely factors into your deliberations. This invisibility of a person or group leads to their isolation from you and your reality. Both this social exclusion and isolation are demonstrated through the delayed entrance of the virus into Africa. Although this twist of fate that I, Africa's isolation and exclusion led to short-term benefits, a delay in the virus's spread, these led to immediate deleterious consequences in vaccine distribution. So despite the fact that vaccines were available to prioritize members of the public as early as mid-December of 2020, as well as the fact that Africa's population is roughly four times larger than that of the United States, more total vaccines were administered in the United States than all of Africa until August 21st of 2022. So to expand this analysis beyond Africa, as the as the as of the final revisions of this chapter in early 2023, 69.1% of the world had really received at least one COVID-19 vaccination, but only 25.9% of people in low-income countries had received a dose. Exclusion and isolation can narrow our interest to self, community, and nation, and set up strong barriers between ourselves and those who we have designated as, quote, our group. All right, so thinking about this, so yeah, us and them and, and all of this. So thinking about this in our final part, so reimagining our world. So I've, I recognize I painted a very um, bleak picture of reality, but Francis points us to something better. So reimagining our world, what justice and mercy could look like in the face of exclusion and isolation. All right. So connecting this to the leper, um, we see that the lepers at, were at, in Francis's time, they were sent away. Um, and when they were not in the immediate vicinity, lepers were pretty much forgotten. Yet Francis believed that God led him among this group that he felt such disgust for. And it is in the encounter, not before, that Francis's real conversion begins. And as far as the sources tell us, the reality for the leper uh, for the lepers didn't change, right? They were still the there were still the sores, there were still the smells. Everything that Francis despised was still the same. It was merely Francis's imagination, that is his way of interpreting his reality, that shifted. He was able to see not quote the lepers, not these faceless statistics, not just a population, but to meet actual human beings who were loved into being by a triune God. He once found them to be bitter, and they became, quote, sweetness of soul and body. Francis saw the lepers as a gift. After his transformation, he sees that it is his brothers, not the lepers, who are the disadvantaged ones. He wants his brothers to shift their imagination, to interpret their reality through a vastly different lens. Francis wants them to be free. Seeing the pandemic through this lens, we can see the ways we have neglected our brothers and sisters through exclusion and isolation. And care, uh, the cures for, for these two are justice and mercy. So mercy is the word that Francis himself uses when he recounts his encounter. The Lord led me among the lepers and I did mercy to them. Mercy was an especially critical consideration for Christian life at the time of Francis. It was not only a feeling one harbored towards those suffering, but mercy was also becoming institutionalized with associations and organizations reaching out to the disadvantaged. It was a cooperative effort. It wasn't simply an individual effort. Justice is a word that is used in a variety of ways today. It's difficult to know what a particular speaker means when he or she uses the word justice in an unqualified manner. Biblical justice is closely related to shalom. Shalom means peace, not only in the sense of an absence of violence, but also in the presence of right relationship. The extent to which individuals and social groups lovingly live in right relationship with one another and God manifests their ability to live justly. There's a clear connection between justice and mercy in the Franciscan context, revealing that there's more overlap than distinction here. Mercy tends to be more affective and focused on the person, 
but the efforts can be collaborative and institutionalized and may address larger social concerns too. Justice involves the larger social picture, but also includes interpersonal relationships. Affection and relationship for, for Franciscans are at the core of justice. Further, although mercy is more often highlighted as a quality of Franciscan ministry, an eye to structural reform was present even in the order. Clearly justice and mercy have much overlap in the Christian understanding and especially within the Franciscan tradition. Considering mercy in light of the pandemic means thinking about how we might meet the needs of the human person before us. I'll offer two ways we might do this. The first is more obviously in the itinerant footsteps of Francis. Like Francis, mercy might require us to, live, uh, to leave our typical spaces and go out into the unfamiliar. Although traveling to Africa is beyond the means for many, I encourage you to go to local destinations that are in some way foreign to you. Go there and see what mercy and encounter might reveal to you. A second way to show mercy is to manifest a humility and an ordinariness in attending to others. Keeping others in mind, including efforts both personal and structural, will yield fruits of mercy. Reflecting on justice in the pandemic means considering the many social groups that compromise our global community and what right, right relationship could look like. It would require us to think about whose voices are not at the table and who is excluded from the global community. Africa and other marginalized regions would no longer be excluded and would instead be integrated and fully participating members of a global family. Justice would also influence the distribution of vaccines. Biblical justice points us towards questions about the universal worth of human life and which populations, regardless of citizenship, are most vulnerable. Congregate living situations, frontline workers, essential employees, the elderly, and those otherwise medically vulnerable are obvious populations that are most deserving of the vaccines, and these groups are found in every country. Justice helps us to develop a solidarity that prompts us to sacrifice for the good of others. I want to leave you with two final thoughts on justice and mercy. First, though, although this presentation is speaking about the pandemic, and Africa in particular, the lessons of bringing justice and mercy to exclusion and isolation have a vast array of applications in our personal and social worlds. Ask yourself where you see isolation and exclusion and how you might bring justice and mercy to that situation. Planting yourself firmly in a posture of encounter will facilitate your efforts. My second takeaway has to do with love. Love is the most powerful thing humans experience. The giving and receiving of love sets us free. It transforms us, it makes us holy. So my second takeaway is that a key aspect to mercy and justice is that we do this not simply to alleviate the suffering of another, but for our own sanctity. At first glance, this might seem selfish. Francis's encounter with the leper reveals that it is not. Our life is less full, our hearts are less free, our courage is less resplendent until we have gone and continue to go among the excluded and isolated and see each individual not as a population, but as a human person. Only then do we realize that we were likewise excluded and isolated from a clearer reality and a fuller manifestation of our own personhood. This realization positions us to embrace a reality more aligned with God's love and our own humanity. In truly encountering another human being, we encounter our own humanness in all of its splendor and frailty and beauty. God wants that. May we go and do likewise. All right. Sister Suzanne, you get to go next. Yeah, all you. All right, so let me uh, pull up your paper. All right, let me just one second. Let me try to get out of this view. All right, let's do this again. There we be. All right, I think we're good to go now. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Maureen. Thank you, Brady. Uh, 
as as I begin this, I uh, would like to share with you how I became one of the contributors and why uh, I picked the particular focus that I did. Uh, I am on the faculty here at Newman University, a Franciscan university. And even though I'm an Immaculate Heart sister, uh, I have become adopted by the Franciscans after 25 plus years on the faculty here. And I'm delighted to be so because I find the richness of the Franciscan heritage as something that is to be treasured, to be spread, and uh, to be promulgated among uh, as many as we can. When Jeff uh, approached me and said, uh, he knew that as a, uh, a student and writer about Francis Franciscan values and traditions, would I be interested in contributing? I sat down for a long time and I began to think of where would my focus lie? And uh, it did not take me very long to settle upon one historic and beautiful figure. And that's the person of Mother Marianne Cope, the saint, the mother of Molokai. Uh, I had heard a great deal about uh, Mother Marianne because the sisters that teach here, the Philadelphia Franciscans, ha adopted a branch uh, from Syracuse, New York, when they were uh, beginning to lose numbers and to run into difficulty to support their various missions. And so they had told me about them. And then came the wonderful news that Mother Marianne Cope was uh, canonized, a saint. And there was great celebration here at Newman and all throughout the Franciscan world. And so I decided that I wanted to know more about this woman. And uh, the more I knew, the more impressed I became. Uh, let me share a little bit of her background. Uh, Mary Ann Cope was, a Germ was born a German uh, in uh, ja January 23rd, 1838. Very shortly after her birth, her parents and herself and her brothers and sisters emigrated to the United States. And they settled in uh, Syracuse, New York. And uh, sh there she worked and uh, there they lived. And her father uh, became the sole breadwinner of the family. But after a point in time, he was injured in the mills where he worked. And so uh, she was in a sense forced to become the breadwinner of the family even though her dreams of a future uh, lay in a totally different direction. She had hoped to become a religious sister, but understanding that with a number of younger siblings, she uh, would have to forestall that. So uh, she did until eventually some of her younger siblings uh, grew old enough to pick up the support. And uh, when that happened, uh, her parents gave her permission to enter the Franciscan Sisters of Syracuse. She, her leadership skills were recognized immediately, even though we might consider her not very well educated. The fact was that she was a master of order of uh, execution of uh, stepping up and picking up the pieces that a good leader is able to do. And so uh, very shortly after her entrance into the sisters, she was, uh, a, a, she was appointed administrator of the uh, St. Joseph's Hospital in New York City. One of the first of 50 hospitals in the United States to be so uh, established. Even though she was still very young in the community, 
by 1870, her order had uh, determined that she was the uh, stuff of which superiors are made. And they appointed her as the mother general of that community. And uh, she held that while she was superior of the order, she was uh, she was the first to organize the two, uh, two Catholic hospitals in central New York and provide medical care that was of a superior nature to that of the time. While she was serving in that role, a priest came to her, a missionary from Hawaii, and he begged her uh, to send some of her sisters out to the islands of Hawaii, especially to the, uh, to the tragic island of Molokai. And even though he had approached over 50 religious communities in the United States, Hers was the only one who accepted, and she accepted. Uh, the lovely story is told that after his uh, plea to her, she and the sisters stayed up all night in reflection and retreat to determine what to do. And by the next morning, every young sister in her house came to volunteer to go to Molokai. And so... Uh, she agreed that she would take a group of sisters over there. And uh, she led that first group herself with the understanding from the rest of the community that she would stay, get them established within a few months and return to her uh, administrative position in New York. As you can well imagine, the latter never happened. Now, why this island of Molokai? How did it become a center of interest? How did it become the island of the lepers? And a lot of that depends on the, uh, the nature of Molokai itself. It's geography, the island lore, it's isolation in the Pacific, and uh, how for many decades, it had little uh, value seen for it in terms of what it could produce or the land value or anything like that for the inhabitants. As uh, one writer, a geographer of the islands uh, notes, cut out of volcanic lava that rose that rose from the oceans eons ago, with part of it crashing into the sea centuries later, one coast of Molokai presents a chiseled fortress of huge and looming rock. You can see from this uh, geographic picture just what that means. Uh, it uh, surmounts 3,500 feet into the clouds. Its geography is one of the reasons the island was left virtually untouched by Western civilization for thousands of years. Also, island lore. It was known to be a, an island peopled by witch doctors, by voodoo, by strange uh, culty groups, and very few people wanted to plunge into its midst and find out about it. Uh, it also was not on one of the major routes uh, that trafficked the Pacific. And even though it's believed Captain Cook visited it, he said that it wasn't going to be productive enough for him to stay, and he soon left. But eventually, the foreigners came. And with them, because they were outsiders, came death, destruction, disease, and pestilence. So when we come to the uh, 1800s, we have a, a, a rock-based island out in the middle of the Pacific that is virtually cut off from uh, 
most other traffic and travel. It was seen as um, an abandoned place. And uh, strangely enough, it was to these shores that the king and queen of Hawaii decided to send a per particular group of their inhabitants. Because with the incoming uh, traders and uh, seamen and so on, of course, foreign diseases were being brought to the islands. And one of the most repulsive of the diseases that came through at that time was that of leprosy. Besides the fact that it as itself was a destructive, deadly disease, the history of leprosy lent even more to the disgust that people had about it. It was credited to dirty living. And by dirty living, I mean not just physically, although that was sometimes the case, but even morally that they saw the leprous sores, the illness, the uh, rotting limbs, et cetera, as a, a physical result of sin. This actually traces its way all the way back to uh, the uh, book of Moses, uh, the book of Leviticus, where Moses uh, claims that uh, the plague of leprosy is that that's leveled against those who live um, sinful and violating lives. So the King and Queen of Hawaii determined that on the barren island of Molokai, they would send the unfortunates who had contracted leprosy. An interesting uh, important note is that because of the Hawaiians' beautiful culture of family connection, very few lepers came by themselves. They came with their children often, with their parents, with other relatives. And so this growing colony of individuals began to populate the island. In the midst of all this suffering, disease, depravity, and the history of, of life on Molokai, it's a tragic one because the, very often the people that went there believing that they were at death's door, and many were, uh, lived lives of a total abandonment. Uh, they, were, they lived lives of great crime, of violence, of drunkenness, of disorder, and uh, it's into this that many of these sick, helpless people are plunged. Some Christian missionaries began to try to establish some uh, small settlements to take care of the lepers on Molokai, but not many would stay. And it finally got to the point that the uh, Catholic community uh, began to beg for priests that could come and stay and minister to the lepers at Molokai. There weren't many responders, but one in particular was a Belgian priest, a young man who uh, following his brother's lead came to be a missioner to the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, kind of uh, interestingly and heroically, his brother never got to Molokai. He developed a fever, he was too ill to travel. And so this young man stepped up even before he was, uh, you know, ordained a priest and volunteered to take his brother's place. And he came as the first true Catholic priest to serve on the island. 
And he served there doing everything he humanly could to make the lives of these poor, forgotten individuals uh, somewhat better. He did carpentry. He built a church. He built small homes. He built almost every coffin in which one of the uh, decedents of Molokai was buried. He gave the sacraments. He went into their homes. Uh, he helped them grow their produce. He helped to uh, work with the, uh, you know, the animals to, uh, you know, bring some kind of herds into the existence. He did everything possible to make a more human life for the lepers of Molokai. Because he was a fairly uneducated man, uh, he didn't have the great schooling that his brother, who was supposed to be the one that came, had. And so some people uh, felt and discriminated against him, uh, including many of the Christian missioners, uh, some of whom were very jealous of the success he had in helping the people of Molokai, and especially in raising funds for the island. And so he uh, he has gone down in history with a blotted record, so to speak. But the man loved his, com his community of people and would any do anything for them and dedicated his life to live with them and eventually to die with them. Because as he said, I make myself a leper with the lepers. He ate with them. He drank with them. He lent them his pipe if they wanted to smoke. He cleared their ground with them. He bandaged them. He nursed them. He buried their dead. And so finally, one day he stood up before the church and he said, today, I say no longer. You, my brethren, I say instead, we lepers. He had discovered a sore in his foot that would not heal, and the foot was becoming numb. And he knew that this was a sign that he had developed leprosy. He was sick for about five years, and it was obvious that he was moving to death's door. Uh, right before he died, he had the blessing of knowing that someone was coming in his stead that would help with the mission that he had started. It was a woman. It was Mother Mary Ann Cope. Having heard Father, for, for uh, the uh, father, uh, come and beg for people to go uh, as missionaries to the island. She herself spoke to her community of sisters and said, I want to dedicate myself to this, but I will not do it unless the community agrees to it. But I also would like to take some sisters with me. They prayed through the night and by the morning, every single sister in the community at Syracuse, New York, had volunteered to go to the island. She uh, she chose six. And so several weeks before Father Damien was placed on his uh, deathbed, Mother Marianne came with six of her sisters to take over his work. So he knew that uh, the work he had started there would continue. Uh, he was eventually named as uh, a candidate for canonization because of the great love, dedication, and literally living martyrdom that he went through. However, he uh, his path to becoming a saint was a rather long one because the uh, some of the stories about him, uh, you know, uh, were that he was a rough man. 
He was very physically able, but also a somewhat boorish man at times. He was uneducated. And so uh, some of the more uh, proper Baptist missionaries and others felt that uh, to name him as a saint in the Catholic Church would be a slap in the face to the other missioners. His delay in approval for sainthood went on for a time until finally another missioner, several decades later, by the name of Mother Teresa of Calcutta, stood up in a conference and said, if anyone deserves to be a saint, it is Damien of Molokai. And she said, if you're waiting for another miracle to happen, this man's life was a miracle in itself. And with that, his cause would push forward. So, his life is a heroic and a tragic one in many ways. Um, the story is told how, uh, as he is dying, uh, the news of his uh, imminent death slips into the papers back in Europe and the United States. And his mother, his still surviving mother, finds out from a neighbor uh, that her son is dying of leprosy. And on the day after he died, the neighbor came in to tell her that her son had perished from the disease. And uh, in terror uh, at what she heard, she dropped over dead the same day he did. However, the story is not a tragic one because Mother Mary Ann's uh, goes on to do what Damien by himself could not do. And she and her sisters began to turn Molokai from an island of disaster, uh, a, a fumigating whole into a place of beauty, of love, of sisterhood, because on this island lived not just the lepers themselves, but as I mentioned before, many of their families, there were children living on that island. Many of their fam parents were dead, but they were alive there. So Mother Marianne came in and she said, we must transform this island from a place of death into a place of life. And one of the first things she did was she wrote back to New York to everyone she knew back there. And she said, send me all kinds of fabric. Send me ribbons, send me buttons, send me little pieces of jewelry, and I will make clothing for the children of this leprous island. And that's what she did. People eventually became to come and, come and see her. And uh, she, she just transformed the whole the whole place into a place of order, of beauty, of joyful sounds of children, and uh, into a place where eventually people could live through this disease into a life of blessing rather than curse. The sisters that came with her were courageous, certainly. But there was one, a very good friend of hers, uh, Mother Leopoldina, who uh, expressed fear uh, to Marianne that uh, they, like Damien, would uh, develop the disease and uh, become lepers themselves. She turned to her and in great assurance, she said, you will never be a leper nor will any sister of our order, and no one ever has, who went there as a Franciscan sister to serve on the island. Many people attribute this to mother's order, to her uh, cleanliness, to her knowledge from the hospitals and sanitation. But the truth is, this was the 1800s. And 
they did not have what we have today in the line of that. So in looking for a better explanation, one of the causes that has been put forth that is part of the richness of Mary Ann's heritage and one of the tributes to her in her move towards sainthood was a uh, doctrine that was uh, brought into existence in the fourth century by St. Gregory of N Nisa. And he has called it the reverse contagion by which many authors uh, interpret it that it means that healthy individuals who are practicing acts of mercy with contagious patients like lepers are unlikely to be affected by the disease. Instead, St. Gregory says, he insists they stand the chance of catching holiness and living with that rather than the horrors of the disease. And so with that as one of the miracles added to her uh, resume, Mother Marianne Colby, Cope, uh, was canonized a saint in the Roman Catholic Church. And it is for this reason that I thank uh, Jeff for asking me to consider writing something about the Franciscan heritage and how uh, they carry on even today uh, the miracles of Damien, of Marianne, of uh, uh, reverse contagion, and all the wonders that came to Molokai. Thank you for your attention and your listening. All right, so let me uh, script, you know, go over to mine. Stop sharing for a second. All right. All right, so I'm going to go uh, pretty fast, uh, see if we can get some Q&A here. Um, why is this not going to the other screen? Try it again. All right, so uh, in terms of this uh, work, uh, you know, I wanted to try to kind of summarize it uh, in two ways. And so one of those ways uh, would be the structure of the work. Uh, and so I started with the historical Francis, right? Who was uh, this guy? And these essays, the four essays uh, that are posted there, talk about what the embrace would have meant for Francis, uh, what it would have meant for the people of that time, uh, the historical conditions under which the lepers suffered, and the sociopolitical backdrop against which these uh, experiences occur. And one of the biggest things that I took away from these essays was that you get the traditional image of Francis, right? The heroic saint single-handedly kind of uh, giving uh, mercy and compassion to these individuals. Um, but the truth was that it was just as much the lepers uh, that served him, gave compassion to him, welcomed him, and ultimately saved him. And I just want to kind of, you know, again, take a look at uh, some of these uh, passages. And I'll just read one. Um, and this is from Gino Gravetti. He writes, both the lepers and the saint had departed from the world of the city. But Francis lacked a community to support his needs, both physically and spiritually. In a small commune, it is unlikely that those in the leprosarium would have been ignorant of these events, or they would have any incentive to welcome the outcast son of a merchant. And so the events to which Gravetti refers... Uh, is Francis's public renunciation of his wealth uh, and his ostracism thereafter. So in that context, the community of lepers shared grace and mercy with Francis, who was welcomed into a place of hospitality and healing that transformed his bitterness into sweetness of soul and body. And there's another quote there from uh, Jean-Francois Godet-Calgarais. Um, 
that kind of gets to the same point. The second uh, series of essays got subdivided into three divisions. So sociopolitical reflections, introspective reflections, and healthcare commentaries. And in terms of the sociopolitical reflections, uh, I think my essay and Lyle Enright's kind of work as companion pieces. I begin with kind of the, the central question that animated the proposal, and that is, should we look at Francis as a fanatic or should we look at our own reaction to COVID as fanatical? And I kind of made this case that Francis calls to question whether there are certain goods and human forms of communion that are worth the risk of disease and death. And perhaps at times we went too far in cutting those off in the name of pure survival. Enright then challenges that vision, and he essentially offers Franciscan humility as the anecdote. Uh, and in that idea, uh, he says that, look, Franciscan humility essentially uh, results in a critique of ideological certainty. And in doing that, I think it gets to one of the, or what I would call the central theme of the book, and that is the non-ideological character of the Franciscan response. And so Enright doesn't say, you know, the anti-restriction position is invalid, but it's invalid if it's the exclusive uh, view. So with Maureen Day, uh, she takes her essay, as we heard, in more of kind of a global sociopolitical direction. Uh, and in doing so, uh, she identifies and highlights another theme of the work, a subcurrent. And I would say the global kind of intercultural nature of the Franciscan response. And we see that also with Sister Suzanne works. Uh, in terms of the introspective essays, Geibel and Prides, they both call their readers to look in the mirror and consider how we react to pan the pandemic. And they really are interested in kind of the idea that we tend to react to things that repel us with disgust. And they're interested in rehumanization uh, and how Francis's kind of embrace of the lepers uh, would involve that rehumanization in the highly polarized context of COVID. Uh, and they both explore that disposition. I think it's interesting, though, Prides writes that lacking in concrete steps that can be adapted and adopted for reflection and practice today, the traditional Franciscan text can be obscure, apart from the role of God's intervention. And she, in terms of going to those concrete steps, turns to Buddhism. And I wanted to mention that because that is another, I think, important subcurrent of the collection, the relationship between Francis, Franciscanism, and Buddhism. All right, the final uh, set of essays in this section is healthcare commentaries. In each of these authors, they call their readers to compassion. And they call their readers to a compassion that they think is lacking in the medical system today and in terms of COVID-19 response in particular. And all of them call for a compassion exhibited in terms of presence. So for Welch, I think it's presence in terms of touch. For Montero, its presence in terms of attentiveness to the personal narrative of the patient. And for Zajner, it's in the rejection of a statistics-oriented approach. And I just want to kind of give one example of that. And Welch writes that uh, untouched patients can feel physically, and you can see the other uh, example on the screen as well, but she writes about the patients. Untouched patients can feel physically and emotionally isolated. Hospitalized patients placed in isolation are more likely to experience depression, anxiety, anger, and loss of self-esteem. It was in isolation that many seriously ill COVID patients found themselves. And then she'll go on to talk about how uh, the lack of uh, touch um, occurred in terms of the bereaved, morticians, and, you know, based on that quote in the slide, the healthcare givers themselves. The third subsection, the third section of the work, I'm calling the uh, followers of Francis. And so this divides, I think, neatly into two different um, sections, and that is Franciscans in history. Uh, so we just saw uh, Sister Suzanne talking about uh, Father Damien and Marianne Cope. Uh, and then Michael Hahn talks about Angelina de Foligno. And she, if you've never read about her or know about her, she's a provocative uh, and quite dramatic uh, emulation of Francis' embrace. In personal reflections, uh, these are people that bring that COVID experience brought to life. And I think it's really kind of valuable. They bring us back to those first days, uh, to the beauty that emerged, but also the death that followed, uh, both to the joys revealed in our shared pause and the anxieties that accompanied our interactions with each other. Barbara Spees does so through 
uh, her interviews with six Franciscans uh, in the early days, whereas Brother Short and Sister Joanne uh, both write from their own uh, experiences, and they both do so from Italy, so one of the early epicenters. And I just want to kind of point out uh, these two quotes from Brother Short, because I think they get to the beauty and the destruction, the fear and the joy, and they do so, I think, in a very Franciscan way, with a real attentiveness to the everyday, the mundane. So he writes, now we always had a resident flock of seagulls who had lived on our roof for as long as anyone can remember, but they are not great singers. We also have their sworn enemies, the crows, perched just within sight of the roof, but they too hardly win music awards. Instead, we had flocks of songbirds, long exiled to the few square blocks of our nearby park, chirping and tweeting, trilling and whistling. This orchestra of voices filled that space, usually dominated by the din of um, traffic. Then he writes, in terms of the destruction, any friar who had to leave the property, even with an official document authorizing to buy groceries or unnecessary medications, would suddenly find himself on his return seat a little further away from others than Neil. Any cough or sneeze raised anxiety. The looming question, of course, was who is next? And my, I'm cut off a little bit here, uh, but he writes, I believe we all became a little bit more introverted, cautious, even apprehensive at times in the company of others. In terms of the final section, uh, this is what I'm calling theological reflection. So it kind of ends on a high note. And I think appropriate because for Francis, ultimately, the destination of the embrace was God and his relationship with God. And in these reflections, uh, I think we get another big current of the work, and that is the fullness of reality, even in the midst of disease and death and limitation. Abbott really talks about that fullness theologically in terms of the number of traditions she brings into her essay, whereas Lambert notes that, quote, few traditions have considered the theological significance of disease with as much bold generativity as the Franciscan tradition. Franciscan theology is inseparable from its capacious understanding of the revelatory fecundity of creation and materiality. And Lambert's chapter, I believe, uh, echoes a kind of a willingness to incorporate all elements of creation, to embrace all elements. And just as kind of a, a, an aside, I think, you know, even in some ways, Franciscans are more radical than Nietzsche in terms of this embrace. And I think in both cases, what these essays do is they really bring forth, again, the fullness of reality, even in the midst of disease, death, and limitation. All right. So that's how the, the work is broken up in terms of its structure. In terms of its central theme, uh, to me, it is that non-ideological character. And that non-ideological character uh, is really, I think, grounded in what I would call a sensitivity to suffering. And so it's a sensitivity that transcends uh, ideology. And it's a sensitivity that is sensitive to the direct effects of the virus, the way in which it destroyed and harmed others, sensitive to the dispositions that cut us off, and sensitive to the way in which those efforts to control and slow the virus uh, took us away from certain goods. And I think what you get uh, in the Franciscan response, and I'm going to use Sister Diana Thompson here, kind of a universe of goods. All right, so just to kind of briefly mention some of these uh, various sensitivities. So the first one is the alienation that occurred. And so I'm going to return to Welch here. And she writes, for those who contracted COVID-19, social death awaited them. No visitors and all staff protected by PPE, inclined to feel that they not only have a contagion, but they are the contagion. And of course, you know, it's true that it wasn't just restricted to COVID-19 patients. Uh, there were many that felt the alienation. And this next quote from Brother Pierre Brunet points to, I think, the comprehensive nature of that alienation. Many age groups of people suffered from radical distance. Scientists noted that since the beginning of the pandemic, the lack of cognitive stimuli and regular physical contact among the elderly excelled, accelerated their aging process. Many children suffered emotionally from not being in contact with their grandparents. Many teenagers missed their friendly relations to the point of meeting, despite social defenses. Our happiness and mental health depend on real carnal contacts. And I'll just mention kind of one thing from my essay, and I, I talk about the acceleration of the elderly. Uh, I note this protest that occurred in this nursing home early on in COVID, the first fall of COVID, where essentially the residents were saying, you know, we want to touch and hug our, our loved ones. It's the only thing that gives us meaning. 
All right, another, you know, I think element of this sensitivity, uh, and it's very Franciscan here, it's felt in terms of a loss of friends that, friendships, a sense that they're cut off from their friends. And this quote from Brother Thomas, and he's one of uh, Brother uh, Barbara Spies's, um interviewees, I think captures this. Before the pandemic, we would kind of hang out with our guests, with our friends. And he's talking about his ministry with uh, uh, giving food to the homeless. We would kind of hang out with our guests, with our friends, because you know them, and they would tell their stories and so on. And that's when it completely changed. And it was really like, okay, here are your bags, and please go, with gloves and masks everywhere. All right, another sensitivity is a sensitivity to the kind of dispositions that cut us off from others and further exacerbate this kind of alienation. And I think this quote from Barbara Spies really gets to that point. In September of 2022, a Franciscan friar and friend of mine were chatting about whether the response of Franciscans during the time of COVID-19 was in any way similar to the experience of St. Francis, especially in his encounter with the leper. As I recall his words, he spoke of how we in this time were so afraid. We didn't go anywhere. We didn't give the sign of peace. Most of us were very frank, trying not to have contact with anyone, engaging in a paranoid behavior, cleaning doorknobs with bleach, very different from Francis's way of doing things. And I think here again of Brother William Short and this notion of COVID involved a kind of an eating away of our confidence with one another. Separation was privileged, uh, caution rather than trust, distance rather than contact. And there's other kind of uh, ways in which we're cut off as well, ideology, uh, being one. All right. While one line of Franciscan thought exhibits a sensitivity to losses related to pandemic restrictions, and another focuses on the dispositions that cut us off, I think it's important to say that the Franciscans are no less attentive to the kind of suffering that occurs as a direct result of the virus. And you see here uh, this image of these 13 sisters, uh, and I won't read the quote, but essentially these 13 sisters die. Uh, over one weekend in Good Friday of 2022. And Brother Thomas offers another kind of instance of the, the way in which COVID killed people, destroyed lives. And he talks about his Native American experience with a tribe in Montana and how so many people died there. Uh, and when I was there, we had funerals weekly, maybe two a week. And you know, it's a tiny community. I remember one of the elders saying, this might be the end of the tribe. So recognizing the grave threat of COVID the threat it poses whenever, to whomever uh, it occurs, is, I can think, very Franciscan. And the final kind of point I'll make here <clears throat> is this sensitivity to suffering and the destruction of the virus makes Franciscans very sensitive to those who are on the margins. And Brother Tony, uh, one, another one of Barbara Spies's uh, interviewees, recalled how I had a patient who was terrified. I think that exacerbated her situation ultimately with her dying because of her anxiety and not being able to stay calm with her saying, how am I going to pay for this? How am I going to pay for this? Yelling that out a lot. And a similar tone of socioeconomic desperation occurs in the second quote. I remember one woman telling me, I just don't have health insurance. I just can't afford it. And if I get COVID, I know I will die. And I have children that I've got to take care of. I just can't allow myself to get COVID. Hearing such cries, and recognizing the vulnerability inherent in them forestalls any simplistic rejection of the restrictions meant to slow COVID-19 spread. And again, I think kind of get to the non-ideological character of this Franciscan response. All right. So with that, uh, I will stop sharing my screen and um, go from there. Hey, thank you, Jeff. Um, I... If I wanted to remind folks who are tuning in, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and we will um, get those going. It's lovely to hear from you and what um, you think you want to hear a little more from. Um, but Jeff, I have a question to start off. Is there a way that we can get a discount code for this book? <laughs> <laughs> there is. Uh, and uh, I guess I could put that in the chat, right? Something like that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There's a 33% discount. Um, so uh, I don't know if I can pull it up right now. Well, I'll try to do that. Uh, okay. And if there's other questions. Um, yeah, absolutely. Great. But great question, Marie. <laughs> <laughs> Very proud. <laughs> 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Well, right now, um, our Google Doc is empty of of questions. Um, there isn't anyone. Um, I would like to know, um, Sister Suzanne, was there anything, um, aside from what you shared, maybe it didn't have in your research on um, Marianne Cope, if you know, obviously you're you were focused on on the the lepers and and how she um was encouraging of her sisters. Was there any sort of just it doesn't need to be related to what you said, but any just interesting thing about her that or that might not be well known by others that you wanted to share? Hmm. Well, uh, I got caught you. Uh, I would say that, uh, you know, many people felt that, uh, as her light rose in the ecclesial ranks of the church, that in a sense, Damien's was, uh, blurred. Because, you know, uh, and even when, this is a little personal thing, Jeff, Jeff said to me, uh, maybe you should put a little bit more in there about uh, Father Damien, Suzanne. You don't have a whole lot of about him. You have more about Barbara Pope. And I said to him, well, I don't really want to do that because, A, he's not a Franciscan except by adoption. And so am I. So I should have heart for him. But also because, uh, you know, it, it took so long for the church to recognize that his goodness was that of the down-to-earth working man. You know, she was more uh, cultured. She was somewhat educated. She was a brilliant administrator. Uh, not to take away in the least from her because uh, she was a loving woman whose main attention certainly was to those lepers. Uh, there's a story told that one visitor to the island came and he was so charmed by her uh, that Robert Louis Stevenson, he was visiting the islands and he was so charmed by her that uh, upon leaving, he sent her a small piano so that she could play music and the children could dance. And uh, somebody, Eddie wrote a poem for her. So, I mean, there was a certain uh, charism that I would say she had. The poor old Damien didn't have it all. But she never uh, dulled his reputation. She celebrated who he was, which I think is a beautiful thing on her part. And she was determined from the day she landed on that island to make the, the few weeks he had left the best of his life. And she did. And, uh, you know, she wrapped his uh, poor wounds in bandages. She fed him. Uh, I mean, I think there was a recognition on her part of the heroism of this man who had cut a pass through. I mean, the island was ripe with criminals when uh, he came there. <coughs> Excuse me. He had to break up fights because there was so much drunkenness on the island. He had to rescue children from their parents because there was so much brutality. And I think she saw that in him. And I respect her even more because of that. Wow, lovely. So and I learned she's in the U.S. National Women's Hall of Fame. Yes, so, she yeah. is. <laughs> there you go. That's another little. Right. So he has questions, if you could put them in the chat. I see John Gilman has his hand up. I don't oh, yeah. I'd like to, uh, first of all, thank the presenters for their work and insights about the various topics that they wrote about and reflected upon. I'd like to add a um, another piece about Mary Ann Cope. Even today, there are two Franciscan sisters, one from Syracuse and one from Philadelphia, who went there in their retirement a few years ago to live among the people who have leprosy 
I was talking to them the other day and they mentioned that currently there are eight eight lepers left there. Some years ago when I went to visit Kalapapa, there were about 45. The youngest of those eight lepers is now 83. And so the population is very quickly dying and soon they will be they will be gone. Another uh, comment I'd like to make is the statue at uh, Marianne Cope's grave is very compelling. It's a um, carving of Christ on the cross. And then it has Francis standing next to the crucifix, looking up at Christ. And one of the hands, the right hand of Jesus is actually off the cross, reaching down toward Francis. And the two of them are really locked in the gaze of each other. So it's a very compelling sense of how the Franciscans represented here by Francis responded so generously by Marianne and the other sisters there to that community. There's just a couple other brief notes I wanted to make about her.